So for now, we're going to talk about some joint work with buddies of mine at Tufts. There'll be microlocal analysis of a joint reconstruction method in X-ray and Compton tomography. And like a lot of math, it starts with a real problem, namely a luggage scanner company wants to use both X-ray CT because they have an X-ray scanner and um, Compton backscatter in order to dis, um, determine the structure of, uh, of luggage. And this is supported by the National Science Foundation and the Simons Foundation. Good. Okay. So um, the experiment is monochromatic photons, that's important, are aimed from sources to an object, which for convenience, we're going to put in a box, namely a negative two, two by three, negative three, one. And our analysis for now is planar data. We're working in new um, results on um, the natural 3D um, generalization of this. And we're getting some interesting results, but um, now I'll report on the 2D. Okay, now then, some photons scatter inelastically when they hit electron. And this generates Compton data which we're gonna collect. And we collect only single scattering. We're not gonna assume multiple scattering. And one can show, I think, um, Gail Rigaud has um, demonstrated that uh, single scattering is important. We've heard the same reports from physicists. And we're gonna ignore attenuation in the Compton data. Um, I should point out that um, you can include it by including a weight in the integral um, that defines the, um, the path of the, um, of the photon. And Rigaud has done some things about that too. Okay, now then, um, we've discussed the Compton data, namely the single backscatter, but also a lot of the um, photons go all the way through. So they're ballistic and they give us standard transmission X-ray CT data. So that gives us two sets of data. Now then, um, here's some physics, um, compliments of my engineering buddies. Um, so the scattering density of the object, which is one of the quantities we want to understand, um, one can show that it's essentially proportional to the density of the object, at least if you have 100 keV or one MeV radiation and the objects, the things in the object have an atomic number less than 20. Um, my colleague, James um, Weber did, used in this database and in the article we show how this proportionality works um, pretty well in practice. Okay, now then, we're not exactly going to assume that these um, any and UE are proportional, but we are going to assume their singularities, namely the wavefront set, are the same or close. That'll be fundamental part of our final algorithm. In other words, we're going to assume that the functions are approximately proportional and we won't use that proportion, we will not use that proportionality as a fundamental thing. Okay. So the cool thing about the Compton effect is that it determines the scattering angle. And so here's the Compton effect. Incident beams, remember, or we're assuming are monochromatic at a fixed energy. And the Compton effect says that two scattered photons hit the detector with the same energy because the photons had the same energy at the start, they have the same scattering. Let's call it omega. 
And that allows us to figure out how the scattering occurs. So the detector measures both photon count and energy of the photons. And for each fixed energy, every photon um, that hits this has to have scattered with an angle of omega, the same angle. Therefore, for each energy, that is each fixed scattering angle, the detector counts the scattering events, which again are proportional to the scattering density of the object with this fixed scattering angle. And so that's how we get the um, object we integrate over. And the points where these scattering events, as we'll show on the next slide, form two circles of the same radius that contain the source and the detector. And to summarize, as we'll see on the next slide, the Compton data for this measured energy are just integrals of the scattering density over these two circles, because you're adding up all the photons that hit the detector. Good. So here's a picture. Here's the source, and here's the object. And they come in with energy ES, And then, they're and therefore, that creates a fixed angle omega, at least when you measure for ED, and you get that photon hitting it, the detector with energy ED, which again determines the scattering angle. And you might remember from um, the good old days in high school or whenever that these points define a circle. In other words, the set of locus of points whose angle between one point to the point on the curve and then the other point is constant, that forms a circle. So we get um, scattering over all of this circle on this side, but of course, we could also get scattering on the other side with the same energy. So that's how we get integrals of the um, scattering density over these two circles. Good. Okay. Now then, um, we'll parameterize those circles as follows. X0 is the midpoint between the two centers, and then S is the distance from the midpoint to the each center, because of course they're symmetric. And so we get two circles, C1 of S and C2 of S on the left side and the right side. And of course, the radius, if the radius is R, S is square root of R squared minus one up in cosmic here. And of course, the circles are just shifted from X zero by S. Okay, so that's the geometry, but the important thing here is the picture integrating over these two circles. And again, the Compton data is the integral of um, F. It actually, I've been using NS, sorry, over both circles. And so we get two integrals, <clears throat> two radon transforms, two circular radon transforms. And then the data, because the, what comes to the detector can't distinguish between the integral over the first circle and the integral over the second, the data is the sum of them. Good. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> filtered back projection is a simple method that often can give you um, at least singularities and features of an object, even when you don't happen to have a reconstruction for it. Now, um, oh, James Weber and um, Eric Miller did a reconstruction formula for this, and there are other reconstruction formulas. There are a lot of results I'll talk about in a few minutes from others. But for now, I just want to talk about our back projection method. And 
because you can't um, compose um, the adjoint, the formal adjoint with T because T of M and E is not of compact support, but the adjoint in order to have a meaningful integral needs to be compactly supported. We take a cutoff in the S variable. And so we only integrate over a, a finite range of S, which of course is practical in the real world. We can't integrate over S going to infinity. And that's another reason to do it. And that gives us the back projection we use, namely T star. I just take T1 um, transpose, but I multiply by phi, and then I add T2 transpose and multiply by phi. And the transpose operator is with all radon transforms are just integrals over all circles in the data set that go through that. Okay. And so our filtered back projection type reconstruction algorithm is this. We take our T star, our um, <clears throat> altered um, transpose, then we put in a pseudo differential operator. At one point, we'll put in sort of the lambda operator, um, well used to really good effect by Aldo Faradani, Kenan Smith, Salman, and uh, Kazansky, and other Russians for lambda tomography. Okay, so that's our original reconstruction operator. And as happens with many um, microlocal, um, well, many radon transforms, when you compose these operators, you get artifacts. And so we use microlocal analysis to understand the artifacts. And that's what I'll talk about now. Okay, in our article, we, um, First off, if we have an object down here, and let's say this is a point X, and C is, uh, um, <clears throat> well, a covector that is representing a singularity in the wavefront set. Remember that the wavefront, or maybe not remember, but a wavefront set for a function that has a, uh, that's discontinuous on a boundary is typically the, um, the normals or co-normals to that boundary. And you can understand singularities in the wavefront sets by the point at which it's in singular and the direction in which it's singular. Good. Okay, so it turns out that if you have a point X and C, you can find a circle with a certain center um, that'll contain X. Anyway, the point is that if D is the set of all X C such that C2 is not zero, namely we don't allow this, we don't allow horizontal vectors, and we let X C and D, okay? The wavefront set of our simple filtered back proje projection reconstruction is contained in the wavefront set of the um, object, let's say, of the scattering density, intersect D. So in other words, we can get at least some of the singularities where the vector is not horizontal. What that would mean is that if this is like the function, ding, 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 here, um, we won't get this direction, but we have a chance to get this direction. Good. Okay, so that's a part of it. And there are these two other point parts that are described in the article. And I'll talk more about them um, in the next part of the slide. Um, I should mention our results 
it doesn't make any difference when we add p as long as it's more or less elliptic. Um, now then, if we had complete data, then the only visible singularities would be those in p. And actually, even if we don't have complete data, so I'll take this out. And the reason is that each of the TJs satisfies the um, semi-local, semi-global Volcker assumption. So the composition of TJ star with itself is a pseudo-differential operator. And that means that it at least um, doesn't add singularities and it will preserve at least the ones in the directions in which this operator is elliptic. Good. Um, if that didn't make sense, what it's saying is that you at least have a chance to recover some of the wavefront stuff. Good. Okay. So now there are these two sources of micro local artifacts, namely this one, which is a function on sets, and uh, gamma 2 1, or lambda 2 1, sorry. And what happens is if you have a point in the co-normal bundle of one of the circles, okay, this is bad planning, but let's say we have a point in the co-normal bundle of one of the circles, we have the other circle. Lambda ij of that point can give you a point in the other circle at which an artifact could occur. And for some points, it's not defined. And I believe I'm going to observe this again, but they come about because you're con oh you're composing T i star with T j. In other words, it's sort of the cross products. Good. Okay, let's see what that means in practice. Oh. Right, 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 I did say. It. These things come from the cross term. And the specific description we do in the article shows exactly how they come and where they come. Good. Okay, so here's an example that'll help you understand um, whether these are important or not. Okay, we reconstruct a delta function. Here it is. And it's hard to see it in this um, picture, but if you were to look really closely or just the uh, color map, you'd be able to see the following. And if you just take these two operators, you can see what you get. You get this and this. And if you look really closely, there's something here. Okay. And the predicted artifacts um, using the lambda one and lambda, lambda one two and lambda two one give you essentially the same. So in fact, our algorithm um, it does reinforce what was predicted. And the only artifacts are the ones that were predicted, uh, not really numerical ones, except if you look closely. Okay, now then, the farther the points from the detector plane, the larger the circles that contain it. And so the farther away the artifact must be, right? Because if the point's down here, the detector, the circles are here. And so the bigger the radius of the circles, the um, bigger the radius of the other circles, so they'll be farther away. So in other words, um, Points that are down here, the artifacts are, can be out of the reconstruction, as we show. Good. Okay. So that's what I wanted to say about the Compton, the basic Compton method. But before I go on to the X ray CT method, um, um, there are a lot of really good work about Compton CT that precedes this. Um, I'm just listing a few people. Um, some people specialized in this American football transform. Um, 
sometimes called the lemon transform or the spindle transform, Simon Arage, um, oh, Renée Hahn, Holman, Lionheart, a bunch of people, also Miller and Rigaud and Weber and some other poles. And then the V-line transform, a bunch of good people are doing work on that. And um, I don't know whether John Shotland's here, but I want to give him a shout out because years ago at a, um, a conference on um, at Oberwolfach, he mentioned this to me and it looked really cool, but I luckily enough um, eventually got involved in it. So I thank him for starting this out. And then for conical transform, a lot of important work. And so that's what I wanted to talk about, about our com basic Compton method. Okay, now let's do the X-ray CT method. Here's the geometry. Our X-ray sources, which generate both X-ray and Compton data, are up here. Well, anyway, you know where. And our X-ray detectors are down here. Remember the Compton detectors are this dotted line here. But many of the photons are um, going to be ballistic. So they go all the way through and give us X-ray data. And so we get X-ray data on all lines from the uh, sources to the detector. And that gives us a limited X-ray data over vertical-ish lines. And if H is the set of lines, I'll refer to that on the next slide. There are these vertical-ish lines that go from the sources to the detectors. OK, so here are lines. Well, here's a reconstruction. It's just a sort of filtered back projection reconstruction where they, uh, where, um, oh, my colleague James just did straight filtered back projection. And the objects are supposed to be a square and a disk. And you can see this is a tad underwhelming. It's a tad underwhelming because the, um, Square, here you can see it again, doesn't look like a square. And the disk looks sort of like a vertical eye or a, um, yeah, or a pointy circle. And there are these artifacts. Here, here, and actually there's some numerical artifacts in the middle, which I asked, um, James about, and he said, uh, we agreed that it was due to sampling problems, but the artifacts on the outside can be explained microlocally by being artifacts on lines at the ends of the data set, going from, in this case, actually, it's mainly from the detectors at the end to sources. And this is something that was talked about in a previous article by um, Borg, Frickle, Jorgensen in 2018. And the point is these artifact lines are a feature of this limited data. Okay, good. Let's look at what the reconstructions do and um, see why we should combine them. Here's a Compton reconstruction. Remember, we're integrating over these circle pairs that go um, that go from the center at the line two, and so we get sort of the um, vertical the boundaries, the vertical-ish boundaries here in the Compton reconstruction, and we get Compton artifacts which can be explained by the article um, that actually by a bunch of things, but one of them is an article that Prickle and I wrote in Science Journal of Applied Math in 2015, and that um, Holtmeyer and uh, Yun and others have also analyzed. 
And then we have the x-ray reconstruction. And that's also underwhelming, but they each, um, they each show complementary parts of the objects. And so that's why we want to put them together. But if we put them together, we're going to get those artifacts. If we just put them together, add them up, um, or you know, make the densities right or the, the comparable and add them up, we're going to get a sort of square and a sort of circle. But we'll also get the um, these microlocal and numerical artifacts, which um, aren't so good. So let's figure out what to do. Yeah, exactly. You could get most object singularities, but of course you get artifacts. Okay, the singularities are well reconstructed by those two things together, but the artifacts would combine. So the method we're going to use is something James came up with, which I think is really cool. Um, first off, I want to give a shout out to um, of the Lambda CT, um, because I told him once about Lambda CT and what it did and how cool it is to detect boundaries. And so he employed it as, um, to my knowledge, a novel way uh, in the algorithm to align singularities. Let's see how. Okay, we're gonna use an iterative joint reconstruction method and we're not gonna force these to be exactly proportional, but we're gonna constrain their singularities to be proportional. And that, or at least to be at the same places. And here's how we do it. Okay. We're gonna use a lambda CT penalty term. And the singularities of these will be close, okay, um, if the radon transform, the radon line transform are close. Okay, this takes a little unpacking and let's unpack. First off, nu is this NIST proportionality constant. So we're comparing the same, something that have roughly the same magnitude. The line radon transform has um, does precise things to singularities of objects, and each singularity of the object goes to a unique singularity in the radon transform. So if the radon transform singularities line up, the object singularities line up. Now, the, where lambda CT comes in is in lambda CT, the pseudo differential operator in the middle is just the second derivative in P. Um, I, I should remind you that, um, or tell you that what we have, the lines parameterized by P and by a normal vector to the line. So P is the directed distance to the line. So we're taking derivative of the radon transform over the directed distance. Now, in the beginning, we know the radon transform over the lines being taken from the limited data, namely over H. But after we get our first iteration, we then can calculate the radon transform of the iterates over all lines. Okay, good, good. And again, the radon transforms encode the singular, all the singularities of the object, taking the derivative emphasizes those. That was one of the key things about lambda CT, um, that a lambda reconstruction amplified singularities by amplifying the singularities of the radon transform. Good. Okay. And this is just saying what I've told you already. Every singularity is reflected by in the radon transforms and emphasized by the derivative. And in the U 
U.S., Faradani, Finch, Richards, <clears throat> written in Stallman and Smith, and then Weinberg, Kasach, and Karotsev in the former Soviet Union. Cool. And the X, and this is another cool thing about this. The X-ray and Compton artifacts will be suppressed because they're at different locations. So the common artifacts are well aligned, but the artifacts at different directions aren't because they're in one of the reconstructions, but not the other. <clears throat> and therefore they're at different places when you take the rat on transport. Good, let's see whether it works. Um, spoiler alert, I think it does. Um, okay, now then, what was done was using a conjunct gradient least squares method. And so we took the argmin over mu e and n e of this mess. So we have the r of mu e minus the x, x or the x ray data. So that's from the um, X-ray reconstruction, the X-ray data, sorry, this doesn't erase well. And then we have the Compton data. And then we have the, um, The lambda, let's say singularity alignment term. Ha. Okay. Nu we remember is the X ray attenuation, and is the scattering density in alpha which appears here is the tuning parameter. Okay. Nu is the proportionality constant, this so-called NIST constant that appears. So when we compare them, the R nu e and R n e, we're at least comparing um, comparable things. And W is basically some sort of X rough estimate of the norm of T over the norm of R so that we rate each of these equally with the same emphasis. Okay. Oops. And so that's the basic algorithm. And it's, and here are the results. First off, we compared it to TV. We compared it to filtered back rejection but that added the two um, sets of singularities that uh, you saw. So it looked even crummier than the TV, but um, TV was not, yeah, yeah, FBP is the worst, and then TV, which you can see. Then um, on the smart suggestion of, I think it was you were, um, uh, it was suggested to linear compare our results to linear parallel level sets method. And what we discovered is for this object, it certainly has the best image, especially if you look closely, and the highest signal noise ratio. But it's nonlinear, so it takes longer. It's not convex. And so, at least theoretically, there could be multiple local minima. And it requires tuning two hyperparameters. You know, and it's it's definitely the best of the three, but it's at least somewhat more complicated. And then our method, the um, you know, you have to have an algorithm um, an acronym for everything, joint lambda regularizer, JLAM, is linear and convex and has only that one hyperparameter. So it's faster and easier. Um, and at least we like to think it gives good edge, it's certainly better than TV. 
but it does give lower signal to noise ratio and higher least square error than LTLS. So our point is it um, can be a useful reconstruction method. And also our meta point is that this can be a reasonable thing to use in luggage testing. Okay, so the outlook, um, well, this is a two-dimensional analog of a method that um, my engineering colleagues are working with a luggage testing company to um, implement, but it's 2D, so it's a start, and we're working on the 3D ways. And the microlocal analysis shows that the visible features complement each other. And a more careful new numerical analysis of the algorithm is given in an article by Weber and Hill. Good. And it's a more careful analysis of the Compton problem numerically. And that's it. Thanks for your attention.